Hello, can you hear me? Awesome, awesome, okay. So uh, my name is Ada Fox, and I'm gonna be the moderator for this diversity, equity, and inclusion panel, and I'm really excited, because this is gonna be an awesome discussion. I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of us are going to learn quite a bit, and, uh, and just generally have a good time. All right. So um, I, I guess we're going to quickly introduce ourselves and then just dive right into um, the conversation. So, um, you know, my name is Ada Fox and I'm otherwise known as Black Carnivore. I uh, have a YouTube channel and a community and I eat the carnivore diet and I encourage people to eat the carnivore diet. And I specifically named myself Black Carnivore because I didn't see other people who looked like me in the carnivore space um, and not even really that many people in the keto space. And so I wanted to make sure if there was anybody else out there who was interested in the carnivore diet but felt intimidated or didn't want to because they didn't see someone who looked like them, that I would provide that space. So I called my black, myself Black Carnivore, figuring that if anybody, was, anybody else wondered, are there any black people who do this diet? They would Google Black Carnivore and they would find me. And that worked beautifully. So, uh, yes. So I served as a magnet and uh, drew those people together. And what I started to do on my YouTube channel was just to um, interview other black people who were having success from the carnivore diet and put it up there because I wanted to make sure that our faces were represented in the community. So uh, in any event, that's who I am and what, uh, why I'm here in the wellness space and looking at uh, and, and talking to people in the wellness space. So let me hand it over to Orlitha. Hi, I'm Orletha Smith. I am, have been in the wellness space for, God, a decade at this point. Um, and I spoke at last year's AHS. I am on the board at Price Pottinger. Um, <laughs> I'm also one of the co-founders of Sip Herbals, an alternative coffee that is aimed at those of us who suffer from autoimmune conditions because I have several and can't have coffee. Ugh. Um, and so that is, that's who I am. Me, uh, I'm Daryl Edwards. I'm, I'm the founder of Primal Play. Uh, I'm an author. And um, I suppose the reason why I'm on this panel really is because when I first came to, to events like AHS uh, around 10, 10 years ago, um, I was pretty much one of not even a handful of individuals of, of color. Um, so, and I'm not even from the US. So, so I felt I traveled across the world uh, to, to come to an event which was talking about health and well-being, uh, but that I didn't see, witness any inclusivity or, or, or health equity, or, or, and certainly there was a lack of diversity. Hi, I'm Simone Miller, and I am a chef and cookbook author and activist. Um, my business is Zen Belly, um, and I have been in the wellness space sort of not on purpose, but just because I've done gluten-free and paleo cooking for a long time, and before that I was a massage therapist, so I've sort of been in the wellness space for a long time, and I've seen a lot of the um, sort of not so beautiful parts of it, and Daryl asked me to be on this panel to talk about some of the anti-Semitism that can happen in the wellness space when the conspiracy theories get brought into it. So that will be my piece today. <laughs> um, and I'm Isabel, and um, as some of you heard this morning, I am a board certified um, health coach. Um, and um, I'm approaching this not just from making sure that there is inclusivity from a uh, cultural ancestral perspective, but also um, in terms of um, the diversity of people that need um, you know, help and that come into the ancestral wellness space looking for solutions and how not everybody um, is operating from the same level. Um, a lot of them have very limiting chronic illnesses. They're not looking for the six pack or optimize their health so they can work 14 hours a day to build empires. Um, but what they're looking to do is really to just get through the activities of daily living without exhausting all of their um, energy resources. 
Um, and I wanna make sure that there is a lot of inclusivity in that space as well. Excellent. So before we dive into it, um, and I think that the, you know, generally what we want to first cover is why we need this panel. Why are we here? Why are we having this conversation? But Orlitha is going to talk about empathic listening before we dive right in. Just because, you know, not, hey, let's have this empathic listening conversation all. We're not here to, you know, have that conversation. But just so that you, you understand that when you're ha listening to us, and thank you all for being here, by the way. When you're listening to us, we ask that you first start with an open mind. You take all of your thoughts and what you've already preconceived and all of your notions of what you thought you were going to hear and what you think you're going to say, and you sort of put those to the side. And that you listen with an open mind, with the intention to understand. Stephen Covey has one of his, his seven habits of highly effective people is to first seek first to understand before being understood. And so if you just seek to understand, then that will open your mind to what we are going to share. And if you are really wanting to go the extra mile, if you repeat some of those things in your own words to other people, that would be great. But also it creates a safe space for us. And it creates a safe space for everyone who may come into this environment looking for the solutions that Isabel was talking about. And they're looking for just to make it through the day. How can I get better? How can I feel better? Those people will find this a safe space if you go at it with an empathic listening um, employed. Okay, so that's all we're asking is just to listen empathically. And hopefully that will be your takeaway is that you learn, hey, something new that I can take back and say, hey, you know what? I didn't realize that this is what was going on because a lot of the things that we've been taught are systemic. It's been in the system. We didn't realize that we were taught this, this way. And then we wake up and we grow up and we are open to learning new things and we go, ooh, that was wrong. Or I shouldn't have gone down that street. And then once we realize that what we were doing was not the right thing, then we can make that change. So just hoping that you all would listen empathically with an open mind so that when you leave here, you leave with something to take away to make us all better. Because if all of us are moving towards wellness, then we all move together, right? If one of us is sick, we're all sick. All right, so let's, let's talk about why do we need to have diversity, equity, and inclusion. Why is this something that we need to talk about? Uh, why don't we start with Daryl? Okay. Um, when I, I suppose I, I could talk from a personal, personal point of view. Um, when, what attracted me to this space is, you know, most of us here, nearly all of us here, we want a health journey we encounter a certain aspect of knowledge where you go, oh my goodness, I found the answer. I found something that resonates with me, that is very useful for, to, to me. And I wanna not only impact my own life, but those closest to me and the world around me. And what I found in a very short space of time is that many people believe that if you are sick, or un unhealthy, um, that it's only your fault. It's purely down to personal responsibility. And there are no other aspects that inform your health apart from the choices you make as an individual. And for somebody like myself, who came from a very impoverished background, ridiculously poor background, and became very successful, I recognize that even for myself, there was a, an aspect of privilege that I had within that space, which completely discounted what it would be like for someone who didn't have access to my education, who didn't have access to my resources. Um, and so, so many people are disenfranchised from this messaging. And whenever I would have heart to hearts about this, whenever I would speak to people about this, usually I'd be confronted with, oh, well, you're just a socialist, you just have communist views, you have no idea about the politics in this country. You know, I'd just be, I'd just be hit with a brick wall of, of you just don't understand. And, and I'd be saying, well, hold on a second, you know, why do you feel that year after year, we are not opening up to, to more inclusion? Why are we seeing exactly the same faces? Why do people feel uncomfortable coming 
into these spaces? Why aren't the audiences coming to our blogs and buying our books and feeling that there's representation? And, and so I probably ignored that aspect for a few years and felt it wasn't that relevant. I remember thinking it is purely about the fact that, well, if I found it, if I had the desire to look for that information, surely anyone else can. But I learned a valuable lesson speaking to my mother. She passed away a couple of years ago, and I apologize if I'm gonna get a little bit upset. But I remember saying to her, oh, mom, you know, um, there's two things you have to do in relation to improving your health. And she's like, what, that's, what's that, son? What's that, son? And I was like, well, first you need to stop using those cooking oils you use. And she says, okay, what, what oil should I use? And I was like, coconut oil, mom, coconut oil. And she went, tell me about this coconut oil. And I was like, extra virgin coconut oil, mom. That's what you need to be using. And she's like, okay, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go to the store and buy some extra virgin coconut oil. And so my mother's Jamaican heritage. And, and I remember the next time I spoke to her, she was like, Daryl. <laughs> I probably won't continue in the Jamaican accent, but she was like, <laughs> <laughs> she basically says, do you know how much this oil costs? She went, do you really think that this is helpful to me when I have no idea how anyone could afford to buy oil like this. And I was like, I just didn't consider it. And I was like, well, it's okay, mom, I can buy the oil for you. It's not a, it's not a problem. She says, no, no, that's not, that's not the solution. That's not the issue. She went, you're telling me that this is the way to health, but I can't access that health. The next time I went to the house, to my mom's house, she was like, come, come into the kitchen, come to the kitchen. And she went, I was like, oh, what's that? And she went, I'm making coconut oil. And I was like, what, what? I says, well, I says, what do you mean you're making it? And she went, my grandmother taught me how to make this when I was a child, right? And she was basically like heating this oil, kind of like, you know, low temperature, and just kind of skimming off the fat from the top. And, then she, and she made this coconut oil. And, and so that was, that made me realize how much of my culture I was not aware of that this was something that I couldn't, you can't just go to Whole Foods and buy, it is something that people can actually make for themselves. The second thing that I encounter was, my, my mother was pre-diabetic. I remember saying to her, mom, 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 thank goodness I'm your son, mom, because, <laughs> you know, I can help you, I can help you out, right? I, I, I can help you out, mom. And she was like, what, what do I need to do? What do I need to do, son? And I says, Mom, you need to choose these foods. You know, I says, you know how you like, you know, your plantains and your yams and like all these starchy and cassava and all these vegetables. I said, you, get, you need to get rid of all of those, right? Get rid of all of those because they're high in carbohydrates. And she's like, okay, okay. She's like, I don't really understand this carbohydrate stuff. She's like, I don't understand. And then she said to me, she went, so what you're telling me then is that these foods that I've been brought up on as part of my culture, my heritage, you're telling me that these are bad foods? And I was like, yes, mom, they're bad foods. And then she said to me, well, hold on a second. What about your grandmother, who's 95 years old, who's never taken any medication in her life, and this is all she he eats? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so why are these foods inherently bad? So that was another question mark for me, which, which made me acknowledge that there was a, a cultural aspect to the ancestral space which is basically ignoring most of, of who is a demography, you know, uh, of the demo, uh, demographical composition of people within this space. And that's why I felt it was important for us to have this conversation, and that's why I petitioned to AHS to have um, this discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that is uh, such an important, and uh, thank you for sharing those um, stories. That really it helps. It helps so much to understand. Would anyone else like to contribute to that answer? Why? Why do we need to have this panel? Um, I can. I can go. I think. Um, you know, we all are familiar with that phrase. We don't know what we don't know, um, and I think that through no fault of our own many times we remain in you know the bubbles um, whether that is the physical spaces or that is the um, 
intellectual understandings or the preconceived notions and the assumptions and all of the things that go into shaping the things that we say and we think um, and we don't realize what are the other perspectives that come into play in other people's lives, people who don't have the same experiences that we, that we have, uh, people who don't have the same um, support systems, people who don't have the same level of um, the beginning point when it comes to their health, people who don't have the same level of resources that they don't have, uh, that we have. So it speaks to um, what we said at the beginning, you know, maintaining that open mind and understanding that um, our collective experiences can make a big difference in all of our understanding and um, we need to have that um, in order to move forward and make sure that what we're trying to promote is accessible to everyone, not just to a select few. So how would you say you've been negatively impacted by not having enough focus on diversity? I would like to just sort of jump in there and say that um, as a person of color, as a person who's living in a larger body, um, as a person who is not usually represented in these spaces, it can negatively impact your mental health. And I think that's something that we also don't take into consideration when we have healthism going on. And by healthism, I mean putting moral standards on health, saying that, oh, if I, as Daryl was saying, if I do all these things right, then I am a good person because I am healthy. And that's not true. There are so many things that are outside of our our control, there are social determinants of health that are outside of people's control, where they, their environment, what they're exposed to, they live in food deserts, they live in places where they don't have the education, they don't have access. And so personally, I was affected in not seeing people who were represented in my circle. As Zero said, when we came into the space 10 years ago, I think there were three, maybe, me and you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw Anifa pretty much on day one of the conference um, in, in Austin, Texas, and I was kind of like, oh, oh my, yeah. oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that's really what happened, and and so for me, what happened is I tried to fit myself into this community by morphing into what I thought health should look like, and so I developed an eating disorder, and so I decided, hey, I want to be as as healthy, healthy, and small, and and assimilate to what these this. Uh, so, so this environment is saying I should eat, how I should look, how I should move, how I should associate, how I, everything. And so I tried to do that because there was no representation of anyone who looked anywhere near like me. Where if I go back into my all of my ancestors, like I can go almost very far back into my ancestry and everyone looks like me. Everyone is shaped like me. Everyone eats the way that I was told was not healthy. You know, you, you, you can't have those things. but. If we decide that we need to be, and, and you asked the question about why is it important, and I didn't sort of jump in there, but diversity is important because if we even think on a biological level, when you have any environment that has low diversity or no diversity, diversity only serves to make every ecosystem stronger. And if we're gonna make this ecosystem stronger and affect the world and say, hey, we want everybody to be just as healthy, just as strong, it's not just for me, it's for everyone, then we have to have diversity. You can't have just every single thing be homogenous because it's gonna die. It'll just not be healthy and won't die. And that's not our goal. Our goal is to help everyone to be as healthy as they possibly can be. Not That's just such an amazing point. So for everybody here in your mental uh, camera, I want you to just click a highlight, put a little asterisk, remember this, because I, I think that you know we all here are interested in biology and this idea of a stronger ecosystem, I mean, nothing could be more apt, a better, a better um, you know, comparison, so thank you. Sorry, the biology teacher came out at me. <laughs> So uh, anybody else? I mean, I, I also have ideas about how, you know, the lack of diversity has negatively impacted me. And, you know, I do a lot of coaching with clients. And the thing that I see is, um, you know, so many of us have been told that, uh, you know, that um, 
a risk factor for diabetes and for, for certain health conditions is blackness. So many of us come to health um, thinking that we inherently are uh, destined to be ill because of what we're being told in um, you know the medical space. And so I have had to really you know, to reshape my own thinking and also working with clients, reshape their thinking and let them understand that this is not our destiny to be ill. Um, you know, we, we do know, and now that we um, have dug into the ketones and all of that, that, you know, the, the foods that we're eating have a huge negative impact on us. But when you think that, you know, it's just your destiny, your genes, then there's no point in making any changes. And so that's what ends up happening. Many people feel, you know, there's just no point. Yeah, and, and I think in, in terms of conventional medicine, you know, we see, you know, um, race-based med medicine, as it's called, whereby, you know, um, there are still um, um, pharmaceutical interventions that are, are, are given to somebody of my heritage just based on the fact that I'm of my heritage. Um, and when you look at the origins as to why that decision was made, it, um, it was based on on something that was outmoded and outdated and, and racist in origin. So, so for example, even things like um, the uh, EGFR, which is you know, the kind of kidney filtration rate, which determines the, the health of your kidneys. So there's a, a calculation which is made, which is automatically adjusted for somebody of my heritage because they assume that, that um, our kidneys are more likely to degrade as, as because, because of our heritage. Right? And that decision was basically made by someone who said, because uh, our skins were thicker um, than, <laughs> than of somebody of European heritage, that's why we need to adjust the kidney readings. For example, that's, that's one of the examples, right? And of course, now we know that our skins are exact, just as the same level of thickness as, as everyone else. The, very the variability of skin thickness exists between everyone of all heritages, all origins, you know, from wherever they are in the world, but, but it still persists in, in modern medicine. Um, and, 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 and it's especially pretty brazen in the US because in the UK, they, they are starting to remove those options of asking you what your heritage is before they decide what medication you should be on. Whereas here, Things are so classified by the social construct of race um, that you know informed decisions can be made by our healthcare professionals on something that is basically isn't isn't evidence based. Um, coming into the kind of alternative health space, you know the average reading age in the U.S. is 11 years old. 11 years old. We complain so often about how many people suffer from chronic disease in this country, right? We talk about how many people have prediabetes and diabetes, how many people are suffering from heart disease and all of these ills. And we go, if only people would just change their diet, if only people would just do more exercise, if only people would do, we do, we do, we do. What we don't realize is all of the information that we ourselves may have access to improve our health is not going to be understood by the vast majority of this country. They are completely barricaded from access to this information. So all the books that we've read, all the research that we've looked at, <laughs> you know, all the podcasts that we listen to, all the people who really need that information are not gonna do any of those things. They're not gonna buy those books if they can even afford to buy the books. They're not going to be listening to those podcasts. Even if they could listen to those podcasts, all of that information is gonna be going totally over their heads. So for me, part of really thinking about health equity is thinking about those who are the most impoverished in society, who, who are the, 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 at the end of the scale in relation to health outcomes. In London, for example, and I know it's the same here with the zip codes, you know, zip, your zip code dictates your likelihood of premature death, right? More so than any of, anything else that we can do in this country, right? In London, you can go, there's a subway or the tube, it's called the underground. You can go from West London, which is affluent, to East London, which isn't as affluent, and there's a 25-year 
difference in life expectancy. 25 year difference traveling along the district line <laughs> from west to east. It's only about what, 15 miles. And within that 15 miles, literally every single step of the way as you come through central London and go out to the east, average life expectancy drops significantly. So we know it has nothing to do with their diets being worse in that part of the city, <laughs> that they're less active in that part of the city, that they're not doing the right things in that part of the city. We know the number one factor and contributory factor to people's health in that region is, is, is money, is better facilities, is a safer environment for them to partake in healthful um, activities. So, so this for me is something that I'm really, really passionate about. Uh, and when I, I started to produce, I have these Animal Moves fitness decks, like these fitness cards. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to start having some diversity in my cards. So I remember creating these cards, and there's, there's, there were all shades on these cards, right? And I remember finishing, people started ordering these packs of cards. And somebody said to me, they sent me an email, and they went, oh, this, is all, this is all really good stuff, Dal, but I'm not happy that you don't have a blonde lady in your pack of cards, right? A blonde white woman in a pack of cards. And I, I remember I wrote back to him, I said, there's a redhead, there's a brunette, there's a blonde, there's a blonde male, right? Um, and I've got Indian, Chinese, black, different shades of black. I've, I've, it's like a united colors of Benetton or Coca-Cola. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, but even that struck a chord of that person saying, I don't feel represented in your pack of 52 cards even though her heritage was certainly represented in those cards. So I thought to myself, imagine it the other way around to this lady. I was just imagine every time I buy a book, a fitness book, if my, if my children buy books, what do they see? Who are the people that they see constantly? And how are they impacted and affected by this? So, so it, it's, we have to put ourselves in, one other sh you know, in another person's shoe to recognize how traumatic this can be for those of us who feel victimized to the world around us. I just wanna add that um, I think a lot of people are in this space because they've been somehow failed by conventional Western medicine and it has, they've been gaslit or they've been dismissed and they've had to be their own advocates. And I've, just through my experience, it seems like that's why most people are here <clears throat> so I just want to sort of throw out there that if this space does the same thing to anyone who doesn't look like them, it's, it's not improvement. It's just, it's just a lateral move, really. <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing any better if you're still basing everything on a healthy white male who can change his diet a little, exercise 10 more minutes a day, and have a six-pack, because that's not that's not the norm and that's not reality for most people. So to just sort of keep that in mind of the reason that you're, you've been disillusioned by you know, your traditional doctor situation, um, that's what most people are still feeling in this space, even though it's supposedly alternative and better and more knowledge filled. I, I really love that point and I've had this similar experience. When I started the black carnivore community, I had a lot of people, especially women, coming up and saying, I really appreciate, you know, you're starting this space and saying that they didn't feel welcome in the wellness space because there is this real focus on thinness, on perfection, on, you know, absolute, like, whatever that perfectness is. And so for people who are not, you know, worried about, like, you know, fitting into that perfect ideal, but want to take care of their families and do all the things that they got to do. Um, that that hyper focus on perfection was just too much, and it it just you know sends you in a crazy place. And so in my community, I really try to focus on like what are the benefits of the carnivore diet? What does it help you to achieve, and what does it do for you? Do you have more energy? Are you happier, and all of that? 
And, you know, the weight loss is great, but, you know, that's not really the focus. The fo focus is getting healthier and being so that you can actually live your life more fully, whatever that looks like. And, um, and I think that that is really important and something that, you know, I would like to see more of that brought to the wellness community um, and not, um, you know, and not this hyper focus on just, you know, I don't know. I guess everybody wants to be Superman. Um, it would be lovely, but it's just not going to happen. We all are going to get sick eventually and die. And um, <laughs> I don't know why I said such a morbid thing. But, um, you know, but, but trying to be Superman, it's just too much. It's too much pressure. And, and even Superman has kryptonite, right? So, so we, acknowledge, we acknowledge the weakness of this superhero, whether it's kryptonite or Lois Lane or his love for humanity, right? Um, but yet, as you say, in the wellness space, sometimes any weakness is seen as, um, you know, it's, moral issue. it's, it's, a, it's like, yeah, it's like a moral issue. It's almost like an evangelical issue where, <laughs> whereby, you know, we have to go out and, 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 and bring people to the Lord. We've got to convert, go out to the Gentiles and say, hey, do it harder. Come to, come to do the Lord. Do some more right? paleo. Do more, do more. <laughs> um, but, but. But actually, I feel it's, it's probably even more likened to a church where you go, hold, whoa, hold on a second. No, let's keep this congregation as small as possible, right? Because we have to be so perfect in our congregation. We can't let, there's not many people who we can let in. And, and, and I think there's an, a, there's an elitism that exists, which makes most of us feel uncomfortable, which most of us can't attain, which leads to people having, you know, being orthorexic which leads to people, you know, becoming anorexic, which leads to bigorexia, as it's called now, for, for, for men like myself who feel, oh, I need to be bigger, stronger, more lean, more jacked, more cut, more take steroids. You know, this, this is a reality. The, and, and, you know, the biggest, the, the largest recreational drug use for young men are steroids, for example, because, because people want to look a particular, particular way. Um, and I'm not embarrassed to say, when I, when I entered this space, I felt I was one of the elite, to be honest. And I didn't have that much com compassion or empathy for others. Because I felt that now, now I'm, I'm now part of the gang and I feel I belong and isn't this great to be this way. But the longer I've been in this space and you live life and you recognize that there are so many things that are outside of one's control and there are so many things that are dividing us um, and they're excluding many individuals, I think we have to do better. Collectively, we have to do a lot better. We have to be sincere and serious about wanting to change the world and changing the health outcomes of those that we say that we, we love, i.e. humanity. So, so you know, I, I, that's the reason why we're having this discussion. It isn't just about having a conversation and a, and a talk about things which aren't that palatable and a bit uncomfortable. It's what can we do? How can we act differently? to ensure we truly can help others who can benefit from access to, to some of this information, which is accessible, accessible and is life-changing and can make uh, a difference, a positive difference to, to many. And it's not pie. Like, there's enough for everyone. So no one's getting pushed out by more people being invited in. I like pie. I like pie. So <laughs> we're going to have pie. We're I like yeah. to assimilate it to sunshine. You know, my grandmother used to say, you know, just because I'm sitting in the sunshine doesn't mean there's not enough sunshine for you. We can all sit in the sunshine. If we would just stop thinking this lack mentality of there's only enough for me and I'm so elite and I'm so cool and you're not cool. It's the mean girl spirit. You know, everybody say mean girls. You can't sit next to me. Right? We want, we want everybody to sit next to us. Because again, if, if, we're not, if one of us is sick, if one group of us is sick, we are all sick. I w I, I, there's no other really way around that. And I think that um, all of us can um, look outside and look, for example, at the uh, veganism environment and um, look at it with a critical eye and see um, the religious-like aspect to it, um, but there are those aspects to it that we hold very dear, and there are very uh, much several parameters that we look at in the same way, and that we think that everybody should conform to those parameters as well. 
I mean, I think it's really important to focus on this as well, or to broaden the um, audience who is willing and to listen to our message, because um, you know we are pushing back against uh, you know forces that want to uh, commodify all of our food so that we you know we don't get to like have grass-fed meat or any meat that grew up you know that isn't being produced. So you know we have a lot of work to do in order to um, just make sure that everybody has access to uh, to good quality food that um, you know we aren't bombarded with all kinds of things um, you know that are in our environment. And if we, you know, in order for us to be successful with that, you know, we have to be able to take this message to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. And um, and that audience is, um, you know, I mean, they uh, have a variety of different beliefs. They look a variety of, di of different ways. And so we need a variety of different people to talk to, um, you know, to our our family, our friends, our relatives, and be able to get that message out there. So, uh, you know, to your point about, um, you know, an ecosystem being stronger with more diversity, that's how our ecosystem of the wellness space um, becomes stronger and gets bigger and grows by being diverse. And I, and I think to, to add to si Simone's point about what led us here, uh, um, you know, we're all curious, uh, we, we all question, um, but I feel sometimes this questioning goes to an extreme <laughs> to the point where because we don't believe this one thing that's conventional, we disbelieve everything. So in terms of personal impact, I've been person personally impact when I was told on social media um, that you know, George Floyd didn't die, that George Floyd wasn't real, that it was a staged incident, for example. These are some of the conversations that people like myself uh, are involved in, engaged in, having to witness, having to listen to. Didn't you see the video? Didn't you, weren't you horrified by what you saw? How do you know it was real? Maybe it was a, uh, you know, a European person wearing a mask. You know, I, I saw a video, somebody sent me a video like that, for example. And there were, there were leaders within this space that hold some of the most horrendous views. And this isn't just about difference of opinion or about freedom of speech. Horrendous views pretty much whoever you are <laughs> on any particular spectrum. And we embrace some of those individuals. We laud them because they may have a great idea in one particular aspect of wellness, but we don't hold them to the same standard as if it was Joe Bloggs doing exactly the same thing. We, we, ex we, we accept what they say because they have something beneficial to say in relation to something that we believe. And I could provide many, many examples of the absolute gutter, disgusting commentary. I've seen the same on Simone's social media. It, absolutely disgusting. I wasn't posting it then. No, you. <laughs> <laughs> she, she didn't Simone. Post it. She did not post it. <laughs> yeah, but but as soon as soon as you take as soon as you take a stand to say, look, I I, I don't feel you know. I don't feel this is acceptable that you're denying um, the death of George Floyd, for example. It's incredible wh who and what comes out of the woodwork. And you recognize the true feelings of many individuals come out <laughs> at, moments, at moments like that. And I don't think they realize the harm that it does for people who, like Simone or like me, when you hear these conspiracy theories um, and you hear these and, and, and it might not even be a conspiracy theory. There are just so many social aspects, and I'm gonna put that in quotes, because mm. it's not necessarily just put into a social box because social determinants affect our health. So if yeah. I'm traumatized, even in microaggressions every single day, every time I wake up, every time I go on social media, these microaggressions, those affect my physical health. And they affect the next person's physical health by just reading this thing, just exposing them to this. Yeah. So they don't understand that oh no, it's okay, they're just a little weird. We're still gonna have them at this conference or we're still gonna have them on my blog or we're still gonna put them on my podcast. It's okay, it's not okay. Yeah, it isn't, it isn't it's okay. It's not okay. I, you know, <laughs> um, somebody can look at that incident of George Floyd and go, it doesn't really affect me. That was somebody else. They may pity the situation, they go, oh, it's okay. For me, I see myself in him. When I watch that nine minute video, I am there. Anyone who looks like me is there. 
So when somebody denies that something like that took place and puts it down to some government psyop or some conspiracy uh, that it was staged, they don't understand it could be me that was there. And when I ask these people, what if it was me? Well, I wasn't there, I don't know. If that was you, <laughs> you know. People don't realize how much this affects people like me. And it was only when I went to, you know, Aunt Simone speaks about anti-Semitism, but it's only when I went to her page and saw some of the comments posted in relation to, to her being Jewish. If I, didn't, if I didn't enter that space, I'd have no idea. I'd be ignorant. I could sit back and go, it's not that big a deal, but it really is a big deal. And many of us who feel protective, who feel that we're in a safe space, need to step outside and believe people like myself, like those on the panel, when we speak up about this. Because it's very easy just to switch off the notifications for somebody or say, I'm not gonna listen to that person or they're overreacting in relation to this. We're not overreacting. We're not overreacting. This is happening. And that is why many of us who believe that we're kind of taking the charge and saying we want to be a part of this, rather than feeling like we want to be excommunicated and go, you know what, I've had enough of this space. Which, trust me, I felt that way many, many, many times. I could, why, should I, why should I be the person who decides I want to stand and battle for this? Why should I? It'd be far easier for me to step back. But then it just makes it easier for those who don't want somebody like me in this space. That's all that happens. Um, and I, I sincerely hope people listen to us, as uncomfortable as it is, as much as we don't want to have these conversations, but we need to, because it's the only way that we're going to make true progress in relation to topics like this. Well, we are coming up on the um, end of our time, but we do have time for questions. Um, should, we, should we take some questions? Oh. oh, I thought you said five. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Get the we have plenty more time. Uh, I was just going to say to add on to what Daryl said is that I think there's this real slippery slope that happens and that most people, again, who are here are here because they've been failed in some way. And I've seen through, I was a massage therapist, so I was in the wellness space there and then being in the wellness space here, I saw a lot of this thing that happened where people have a very understandable, extremely warranted mistrust of something like big pharma. Um, and that sort of turns into this mistrust of everything. And so it's like when Daryl was saying, the people who are saying, I don't believe anything unless I was there to see it with my own eyes. That is, aside from being like, so narcissistic, I don't even know how someone's brain goes there. Um, but it's very, it's like real Holocaust deniery. Like anyone who thinks that nothing happens unless they were there to see it is deranged. And it's sort of like this <laughs> slippery slope thing that happens where, like, yes, you know, maybe Big Pharma doesn't have our best interests in mind. Maybe they are really just trying to make a profit, sure. Um, but that does not mean that. George Floyd was a false flag, that you know, a school shooting was a false flag, that, um, that George Soros is you know, up there with his puppet strings controlling everyone, and that I'm over here with my Jewish space laser like zapping you all with Bill Gates' microchip so I can like, control your brains. Like, it, it goes there, and like, it's funny, but it's also like, it's funny because it's ridiculous, right? Like, and there's there's parts to all of these ways of thinking. Some of them do, you know, they make sense and they resonate with people. You know, like why should we trust the government? Sure. Um, but the sort of drop off of the slippery slope that happens is harmful. And it's harmful to anyone who is different than the people who are wrapped up in these theories. And it doesn't make any space for people to be who they are. And it's just, I would just like to sort of have that in everyone's 
mind. I can't zap it into you because I don't actually have a Jewish space laser. Otherwise, I would and I would have just stayed home. But is it, is it like a Men in Black zapper? Is that is that maybe? Yeah. Maybe. Um, so, like, just keep that in mind when you hear these ideas. Like, you have to sort of work backwards and figure out where did this actually come from, and is 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 it based in fact or is it based in fear and a little like insanity? So now believing your any experience that's not your own just simply invalidates everybody else's right. experience. Um, and if we come at things with that um, viewpoint, then we simply cannot get to an understanding at any level, um, and that includes our health as well. But it's like we we have social media where people are talking about their experiences and sharing them. So clearly. Everybody is interested in other people's experiences. There's just certain experiences that people are not interested in. And I think that, you know, that needs to be, be stated. I mean, because, you know, it's not all experiences that are being invalidated. And I have to say, you know, for me, I am not a person who generally enjoys confrontation. Um, both of my parents are lawyers. My mom loved to be in court and loved to get into a fight with somebody and would do it even on her own time. But that was not, <laughs> that was not me. But I still felt, the, the way I felt in this space, I, I decided I had to create a social media platform where I directly address these things. And I don't know if you all are familiar, um, the uh, Paleo FX, um, live stream. I, I had them on my channel and asked them all of these questions and this is where, uh, you know, a lot of their beliefs were, we, you know, I, I pushed back on them and really tried to understand, you know, what was going on in their heads. Uh, but that was not the first time that I had raised this issue. I also um, I called out Sean Baker and the MeetRx community for creating a really hostile environment uh, for, for black people who were part of that space in 2020, in June of 2020. And he told me, um, you know, he said, uh, I was explaining how a woman um, was, uh, how she was, uh, how she was made to feel in one of these uh, online groups when someone basically spent 10 minutes ranting about why everyone is talking about some guy who got killed. And, um, and he said, well, did she say anything? And I said, I mean, if you're a one black person in a group of 20 people, I don't know that you feel comfortable saying anything. And he said, well, that was her fault. She should have said something. And I said, no, you're the leader here. It is your responsibility to, you are setting the tone for what happens in this community. And that's when we went back and forth. And that was, you know, the, the result of that was me leaving MeetRx, putting out a couple of videos explaining what happened. And um, I, you know, and I, I do try to raise this because I think that it is important to know who it is you're listening to. And just because you are getting, you know, some information that is helpful and accurate, you know, around health, that I don't know that, um, I don't know that I always necessarily trust it. I mean, we've already talked about systemic racism and how, uh, how that affects the medical industry, how that affects even the way we, we think when we go to the doctor. Well, I don't know. I mean, I feel like when I am dealing with someone who is not um, necessarily respectful of my experience, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to get the best medical care from them, even if they are, you know, an expert in the field. So um, anyway, that was my own rant that these are things that I have been thinking about and I think are really important. And um, you have something to yeah. say. And then we do have a question. We are going to make sure questions happen. Of course. Well, I just wanted to add that Empathy helps to build trust within our community. When we listen and we are open, then it helps to build trust. That trust is what will welcome other people who may not look like you. It'll help them to feel safe. It will help them to open up. It will help them to share their ideas. And that diversity of ideas is what is going to help our community to become stronger and to propel it and to affect other people. When you are in these circles, and you're not affecting anyone, then it's kind of pointless. You know, it's, there's a, a saying that says, if you're the smartest person in your circle, you're in the wrong circle. You're right? <laughs> right? Same goes with our health and wellness. If you're, there's somebody that you are, you're in the circle, everybody's healthy, everybody's well, yay, us. What's the point? Who are we helping? How are we making this world a better place? 
Because we can all sit in this room and be healthy and talk about how great we squat and how much we can do, how great our food is. Yay, us. Who are we helping? What change did we make? What safe space did we create for someone who doesn't look like us or think like us? We didn't. So let's, I think that's the important importance of this, this panel is just to encourage you to maybe think outside the box. Go into circles where maybe you are different. Understand how that feels. Walk into a room where you're not the, where everyone isn't, doesn't look like you, everyone doesn't think like you. Talk to people who have different, maybe different thoughts. I don't know. Sure. And, and just, to, just to add to that, because I'm, I'm, I'm the only male on the, on the, <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> But um, in all seriousness, you know, I, I had a discussion um, talking about, you know, there was a, there was a time where there were certain leaders in this in this space who who were, were rape deniers, who said there is no such thing as rape, right? And I I feel that's out, that's abhorrent. Of course, the of course rape exists. But they, these individuals had their justifications for this, right? And my thoughts are, if you give these people a platform, even if you feel it's worthwhile hearing what they have to say in this matter, unfortunately, the one in four women who have been subjected to, to sexist, sexual abuse or worse are going to be, feel traumatized. And we may not know who those people are, they may be sitting in that, in that forum, staying silent, being traumatized, and having flashbacks over the events that occurred. And it strikes me that even for myself as a man, you have to step outside of where you feel comfortable. I have to realize there was an advert by, um, what's it, Samson recently, you may have heard about. They had an advert, a woman jogging at two o'clock in the morning, headphones in, having a great time, hey, I'm getting fit at two o'clock in the morning. And people started saying, hold on a second, there were obviously no women in that room with the advertising execs when that was, when that was passed, right? And, and many people are like, I don't understand what you mean, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, because, because a woman would not go out to run on a public, in a public park at two o'clock in the morning, right? Because they, they know it's not a safe space for them. Whereas the male advertising exec would probably go, isn't this a great idea? It's peaceful, there's no one else outside, isn't this great in the moonlight? And that's almost the point I'm trying to make. That's the parallel I'm trying to draw. It's very easy for us to stay where we feel safe and where we feel comfortable and we just have no idea how the others feel and think about a particular issue. Well, um, yeah, so I, I think it's time to move on to questions. So um, I've practiced medicine for 40 years. Um, in the ancestral health community, there's a lot of trashing of allopathic medicine. And uh, for 35 years, I was chronically sleep deprived because <clears throat> I was on call every third night, saving lives in the middle of the night. With drugs, that saved somebody's life. So I think this community needs to be more open-minded to the benefits, uh, um, not oblivious to the economics of big pharma, okay? But I have used drugs. I'm an anesthesiologist and critical care physician. And so I think this community needs to be more open-minded and, and has in the past excluded the benefits of allopathic medicine. In, in my practice in the pain clinic, which I transitioned to after retiring from 35 years of sleep deprivation, I used integrative medicine, all the ancestral health concepts, trying to help people in chronic pain, minimizing interventional procedures, but I found that it's very difficult to change human behavior and unless you can remove pain 
with injections and procedures that I specialized in, you won't have a receptive patient. Once you relieve their pain, they may start to believe that they need to change their diet, their sleep habits, or all the things we talk about in this kind of conference. So I'd like to see what this panel thinks about in terms of my suffering from hearing constant disparaging remarks about allopathic medicine. So you want to take it or? Um, <laughs> There's a, yeah. yeah, you want to go first or you want to take it? Can I just say Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that I was using Big Pharma as an example. I, like, thank you for bringing that up because I've actually really sort of gone a little bit backwards. I, I went a little dogmatic with the whole wellness thing when I first realized that I felt better eating a certain way and, you know, prescriptions have so many side effects. My current reality is that the only reason I can sleep at night is because of trazodone and I would probably have panic attacks daily without Zoloft. So, like, I think that the wellness community needs to actually look at like holistic care, everyone sort of makes that mean all natural, but holistic should mean holistic. And I do absolutely think that there is a time and a place for medications. And I, I didn't wanna like, cause I know that I was sort of using that as an example. And I do think that like most corporations have some like gross stuff behind them, but that doesn't mean that there's not a place for actual holistic care. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to 1 million percent agree with you because um, as somebody who has a laundry list of chronic conditions that are very painful and cause a lot of fatigue, um, and that's the patient population that I work with, um, as I said this morning, we need to remove the dogma that there is a one standard of care for everybody and that while telling somebody to eat right and exercise is the right thing to do, it is not sufficient for people to even get to that place. Um, we can all benefit to uh, we can all benefit from making changes to improve our health. But for a very large group of people, um, there are far more interventions that need to happen before they can even think about um, that particular um, way of living. So, you know, we need to remove that dogma and we need to understand that everybody is different and that everybody needs different interventions. And like Simone said, you know, a holistic perspective is really necessary because we live in the real world. You know, we don't live in the middle of nowhere with no access to TV and, um, you know, having to go to work from nine to five and having to raise three kids at home and having to make dinner and having to you know, fulfill a million different um, commitments that we all have. Um, so because we are in this environment, we have to consider what this environment has done to our collective health and the resources that we have in order to just cope sometimes. Yeah. We, we have two more questions and only two more minutes. So uh, I would love to hear both questions. Thanks for the work you do, Bob. Thanks for the work you do, Bob. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, some of you mentioned uh, George Floyd and paleo facts, and for people who are not aware of the conversation, uh, what happened, where can they get more information? There's a website called aboutpaleofx.com, which has a collection of all of the um, concerns, the posts, the, the um, videos, This might be opening a Pandora's box in the last minute, and, and I apologize, but I, I have just been thinking for the last 20 minutes about how in the wellness space do y'all think we can strike a balance between, hey, I have this set of lifestyle interventions that might dramatically help relieve your condition, your symptoms, your, your woes, and the awareness that 
maybe you can't always just paleo harder. Maybe this impact of the social determinants of health is really playing way, way, way uh, deeper and, and broader of a role in your condition, like, like the cohort of diabetics who were in Section 8 apartments in a violent neighborhood, who then, in a study, were transferred to a nice, safe neighborhood with nice apartments, and all of their, all of their diabetes blood work, I mean, their, their, um, their blood sugar, their insulin handling, and their um, everything, all of their markers started to improve just from the one intervention. How do we strike a balance between this is this set of things that I do that I've discovered and researched that might help you and the people who don't respond to it? And I, sorry I think, if that's too involved. No, it's not. I, I think that the first step in trying to help anyone is to let them know that you're not the guru. I'm coming at this from what worked for me, and we may have to discover what works for you. Maybe it's two or three of these things and one of those things and something we haven't discovered yet, but I just would like to offer this to you. Not, this is the only thing that's ever gonna work, and if you don't do this, you're not a good person. Like, that's kind of what the wellness industry has turned into, is this is it. If you don't eat this way, if you don't do this way, if you don't move this way, this is it, right? But if we come at it from a perspective of it's not binary, it's not black or white, it's all nuanced. All of us have nuanced situations. And what one person, what works for Daryl isn't gonna work for me. What works for, for Simone isn't gonna work for me, or it might, we can figure it out, right? <laughs> so yeah. maybe coming at it from that perspective would help, and, and it would also help people, again, build trust. Like, hey, I'm trusting this person. Think about it if you have a leader who's never wrong. They never make mistakes. They can never say, hey, I, was, I made a mistake there. You don't trust them, and you're not gonna hear anything they have to say. But if you come at it as, from a perspective of maybe I'm wrong, but here's some things that might work, and let's figure it out together, then people are more apt to listen. I think we're out of time. We're already 10 minutes past our, where lunch break was starting, but we appreciated all of your sharing. Let's thank them for their bravery to come here and put this together and share.